What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ Bucky back with you. It's been a minute, Buck, since we've been together. How you doing, man? I'm good, DJ. It's crazy, man. We were a couple weeks out from training camp, but the NFL news is still flying. Uh, you have started looking at the 2023 draft class, so we'll talk about some of the stuff there. And then just trying to put it together because, you know, once training camp starts in literally two weeks, it is a marathon until February. So just trying to do the last minute things to get ready for it because uh, it happened before, you know, we're right back at it. Yeah, it's go time for sure. Um, some uh, some news we need to catch up on today because we haven't been together. We'll hit on the Baker trade. Uh, he goes to the Carolina Panthers and kind of a fascinating trade just in terms of the money uh, that the Browns had to swallow, the low pick. Um, that, that the uh, Panthers gave up. Anyways, we'll, we'll dig into that. Uh, you mentioned starting to dig into some of these draft guys. Uh, Kentucky quarterback Will Levis has got a lot of juice and a lot of buzz in scouting circles, so he was the first one on my list to do over the summer, so knocked him out the other day. Um, and then also want to touch on um, you know what's going on in the college landscape, which is kind of interesting with the two L.A. schools, SC and UCLA, uh, making their way to the Big Ten. What does that mean? What does that mean from a scouting standpoint as well? Uh, we'll touch on that. Uh, but first of all, Buck, let's start with Baker. Uh, just your immediate reaction. I know there was talk about Seattle. Uh, that doesn't happen. And, man, Seattle must really like Drew Locke because the cost for this Baker trade was next to nothing. Yeah, no, it, it, it's surprising. I would I would say, like, uh, the Seattle Seahawks have let the world know how they feel about their quarterbacks. They're going in, all in. Drew Locke, Geno Smith, kind of figure out what happened. Uh, we'll see. That would be an interesting conversation down the line. Baker Mayfield going to Carolina, to me, is really interesting because of uh, what every what the Panthers gave up to get Sam Donald a year ago. And then when you hear about how it went down and how ownership was trying to get Baker to take a $7 million pay cut, and then they settled on the $3 million and a half pay cut, and they are getting them at $5 million per, I mean, it's a nice deal for the Carolina Panthers. But I'm trying to tell everyone to slow down on just assuming that Baker Mayfield is going to be the starting quarterback week one. I think, if anything, this really sets up to be a true competition. And I will say that I believe Baker's a little bit behind the eight ball just because of when he's coming into camp. DJ, he had an opportunity to come in mini camps, OTAs, and all that to kind of learn the system. Man, I think it's hard to learn a system in training camp while also competing for the job. And so – you got a true competition between two guys that were top five picks in the 2018 draft. And I think if you're the Carolina Panthers, you let this one play out the way that it plays out. Okay, let me let me turn around, play devil's advocate on this side and say, okay, if you are Baker Mayfield and his representatives, and it was reported that they had conversations um, with Scott Fitter, with Matt Rule of the Carolina Panthers in order to kind of facilitate this trade. <laughs> to me, the most interesting aspect of it was not the money that the Browns ate was not the low draft pick that it cost the Panthers. It was the fact that Baker, he left three and a half million bucks on the table. He ain't getting that back. That's gone. So my question is, Buck, I, I agree with you. I think the advantages you could point towards Sam Darnold being in the system for a little bit longer, familiarity with the personnel. But how in the world do you convince Baker to give up three and a half million dollars without giving him a wink nod that he's going to be the starting quarterback? I don't know, but then a lot I mean, wouldn't you say that if you're if you're I mean, if you're, him, would, if you're Baker, you'd be like, hey, you want me to give up three and a half million bucks? You better give me some assurances I'm going to get on the field so I can get that money back. Yeah, unless they appeal to Baker's competitive side and said, "Hey, man, Sam Donald's here. You beat him out, you get the gig." And maybe yeah. that Baker saying, "Okay, let's go get it." You know, yeah. a guy who's a two-time walk-on, a guy who did it at Texas Tech, did the same thing at Oklahoma knock off a five-star quarterback to do it. Maybe that's Baker channeling that inner walk-on to be like, oh, I'll, I'll go get it. Because really, where else do you go if you're Baker to have an opportunity to be a starting quarterback? Because if Seattle This showed you nobody there, wanted you. This this was evident by the cost of this. And there was no market. Right. Zero. So there was no market. So, so this was the only place. And so that's why I, I, I truly believe it had to be like a, a competition now. To bring him in, maybe you say, like, hey, man, we're not really happy. Look at the numbers. Look at the way that we performed last year with Sam. You will get every opportunity to do it. But I just, I mean, I can't imagine them saying this is going to be your job. Because as much as people talk about how much they're paying Baker, they're paying Sam 
Yeah. That money's not going anywhere. And so I don't know, like, what does it look like? And what would the market be for Sam if you try and trade him? So that's why I believe it has to be survival of the fittest. We're gonna put the ball down and whoever performs the best in training camp and preseason, that's who's going to be the starting quarterback when they run out the tunnel against the Browns. So to put this kind of in context in terms of the money, right? If you add Sam and Baker up, you get to what half what Aaron Rodgers is making? Yeah. I mean, at the I end mean, of the day, it's, it's just it sounds crazy because it's gone up so fast, but you combine the two and you're what 25 million or whatever it is, like that's half oh, not, that's half the I mean, top of the market right now. I mean, it's it's, it's it's low level starter quarterback money. Uh I think what's what's fascinating though, and it's kind of funny because I, I don't see myself as like a Sam Donald Homer, but I do think it's interesting because we've never seen this. Like, DJ, it's one thing to go see quarterbacks go back-to-back at the combine. It's another thing to see them in practice every day. Yeah. And I will say that when you see Sam Donald in Bayfield as a scout, it is interesting because it's going to play with your emotions, right? Because everything from a prototypical standpoint is going to say Sam Donald should be the guy because he's bigger, he's faster, he's stronger. Um, arm talent, I would say, is, is comparable. The better player through this point of the career has been Baker Mayfield. But even in saying that Baker's been a better quarterback, and look, by leaps and bounds, Baker Mayfield has 92 touchdowns. Sam only has 54. Uh, Their completion percentage is around the same. Baker has almost like a 10-point differential in passer rating. But the counter to that would be like, we'll look at the situation in Baker. Who was he with? Who was in front of him? Right, like, 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 like those things. And so for me, the reason why I say this is a true competition is because you know, once you leave a place where you're the number one overall pick, the Carolina Panthers don't care about that. They're not tied in. So no. this is actually whoever runs out there and whoever's completing the passes as they're charting, whoever um, the offense looked like is gravitating towards and whatever, they can go with that guy. And so the reason why I say Baker's behind the eight ball is because we all know that Sam Donner is a great dude, right? Yep. Great dude, A1 dude. Going all the way back to what was said. Likeability is very high. Listen to what the people said about him on the way out from the Jets, the friendships that he's already established at Carolina. Like that matters. What we heard coming out of Cleveland from Baker, like, A, wasn't necessarily exactly what you want. So what we're asking Baker to do in a six-week period is to build those connections, outperform Sam, and know all of the stuff that the coaches want. To me, that's a lot. I'm not saying that it can't be done. But I'm saying it's not as easy as, hey, let's just pencil Baker Mayfield in. This is good. Unless the Panthers are just off on Sam Donald based on what they saw last year and through the offseason workout. Yeah, and I know, again, I was real high, sky high on Sam Donald. I had him as the top quarterback in that draft class. So I always get kind of called the Sam Donald homer. And I, I, I look, last year I can't – you can't defend it. I can't really defend the way that he's played throughout his career. What I can say is, man, I – I don't think he was given much of an opportunity or fair shake in either place. He actually found a worse offensive line in Carolina than the one he played behind with the Jets. But yeah. now it's going to get a chance to answer. Like this is, you know, Sam is still what? I think he's younger than Joe Burrow, right? So he's still he's still young. Mm-hmm. And you say, okay, we kind of know who he is because he's played enough. And, and maybe we do. Maybe that's the case. But I know if you're 90% or 85% sure you think you know what Sam Donald is or isn't, after this year, after this competition, if this if they don't move him, if they let him and Baker go head to head behind the same group of, of players, throw into the same group of players against the same teams, we'll, we'll know. Like it's going to be a hundred percent. It's going to be a hundred percent on them, and we'll find out just how good the infrastructure was in Cleveland. Maybe we overrated it. Maybe they maybe that wasn't such a you know as, as QB friendly um, as we all kind of thought it was from the outside. I don't know. Maybe Baker's got a chance to shut us up. We'll see. And so this is what I say is a scout's dream. Because, DJ, we always talk about, like, the, the quarterbacks at the top. We just looked at the most recent draft class, and we can compare and contrast and all these things, but it's not necessarily a, a apples-to-apples comparison because you're playing in different environments. This is the first time that we will see two top five picks on the same team in their prime in yeah. a situation. It's only ever happened one time. He and the Oakland Raiders. At Jim Plunkett and Dan Pastorini, they were number one and number three, respectively, in the 1971 draft. And that's like nine years of work before they play. Like this, they're four years, five years in, 
we're yeah. really going to see a remake of that 2018 draft, and we get to do it without the excuses. We get to see same offensive line, same wide receivers, same playbook. So to be clear and apparent, if Baker Mayfield's a better player, it will be obvious pretty quickly that he's better than Sam Darnold and vice versa. And so to me, I think in the Panthers' favor, you always want to have real competition because it makes everyone better. And I will say this about both guys. Both guys have played the underdog role in college, and they found a way on top. We mm-hmm. talked about Baker twice as a walk-on. Sam Donald knocked off Max Brown when no one thought that that was possible. So this would be interesting to see how they compete for this job and what I think should be an even Steven contest. Yeah, no, it, it's going to be fascinating. And it's not even just kind of what we're talking about on the field, but how do you ingratiate yourself with your with your teammates and and, and fit in from that standpoint? It's going to be it's something that, that matters. You know, we'll see how that goes. So I said this is like a, a, a WWE match, a loser lead town match. Yeah. Because here's, here, here's the other thing. If you lose the competition, do you have the wherewithal to be a good backup quarterback? We talked about the backup quarterback and what the, the quarterback's duties are. Mm-hmm. He's not to compete with the starter. He is to support the starter. And serve him, yeah. And he also has to do it without getting a bunch of reps. Like, typically, the backup quarterback is one of the best dudes on the team. Everybody loves the backup quarterback because he's had he, – look, he doesn't get the reps. So he has to kind of build this rapport with the team without being in the huddle be interesting to watch how this mm-hmm. plays out how can you deal with all of this other stuff and compete and maybe be the backup quarterback it's a unique circumstance well i think that i mean everybody's talked about well they'll trade sam Darnold, but i mean you tell me i i think sam would have a less of a market obviously based off production than what baker had and baker's market was nothing you got to eat the majority of the money you're going to get a, a late late pick there's no, I don't know why they would trade him. I, to me, it's like, no, okay, this is a good old fashioned QB battle. Let's just see how it goes. This is it for the year. Both of them are on the team for the year because who's going to trade for them? Whoever yeah. loses the competition, the value is even more depressed. Right. No one's going to trade for that unless there's a, an injury, injury or something yeah. like that. And then, DJ, when do you make the decision? We only have three preseason games. Yeah. Normally, the dress rehearsal is oh, joint practice, game number man. two. Yeah. So we, I, I need to look that up. We need to find out who they are, who they are practicing with uh, Carolina. I guarantee they have some joint practices and those will be probably the most important and influential joint practices that we've ever seen, because it's going to help decide who their quarterback is. Yeah, they have to go. You have to literally split the reps right in half. You have to have your, your ones play more to give both guys a fair shot at winning the gig. It's going to be a real interesting thing. And for Baker, he has to do it and learn the offense on the fly. And I'm going to say this because, like, there was the New York Post report where they brought up Ben McAdoo's comments from 2018, and he talked about Baker, and uh, he talked about being undersized and, and those things. He said, look, it's hard to just kind of, like, outcompete some of the deficiencies that you may have. Like, I'm paraphrasing. Um, yeah. And, and, and so people will say, well, like, oh, well, he doesn't want him. I said, it doesn't change that just like you and I whatever you mm-hmm. think about someone in the pre-draft process is different when, once we see them play because now I'm grading them based on how they perform and so Ben McAdoo has to look at both of these guys give them the same kind of stuff while in his mind he has to build out two playbooks for each quarterback because the way Sam plays completely different than the way Baker I would think has to play and so you have to build two different offenses while looking at a quarterback competition. And you still got to have that second offense ready to go because what if one of these guys gets hurt and the other guy has to be your full-time starter? It's just a lot. It's a lot on the coaching staff to get done in a short amount of time. Did you see what Nabil put in the chat of who their joint practices are with? You think Sam Donald's happy about that one? Oh, I guess the Patriots. Oh, boy. Was that the ghost? Was that the – Yes, that was seeing the ghost. Yeah. They, may not, they may not fully give them the ghost package, though, in practice. Yeah. But yeah. It won't be good, but – I can't imagine having an opponent. If you could tell me, like, hey, who could I go against to, to, to serve as my litmus test? That's a good one. It's a good one because you're definitely going to know. But, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just different because you, you figure that those uh, – not only is it, you know, Bill Belichick over there in terms of him knowing Sam, 
but you've got that defense, you know, those guys that have been there for a while, they've seen a lot of Sam, you know, you know how to bait him, you know, what he, what gets him, what traps him, you know, sometimes doesn't necessarily have to be the call. You don't have to, to put a call with the skies. It, it might just be you're an underneath buzz defender. And you know, if I take one step to the left, he's going to take the cheese. You know what I mean? Like that, that type of knowledge. So we'll see, but you know, Baker's got to, got to see that same group. I just think they'll have a little bit more working knowledge of, of Sam Donald in those joint practices. We got it. We got it. Man, I'd love to see the video of that. That's going to be fun. Man, look, they should live stream that one. Cause that's the one that you're going to watch. I bet you their games on TV a ton. Everyone yeah. is going to look at that. That's one of the more compelling storylines of the off season. Being able to see Baker Mayfield, Sam Donald go back and forth. And I'm curious to see what their relationship is like in that quarterback. Room. Yeah. That's, the thing, because you got to remember, both of those guys have been franchise quarterback at previous destinations. Now you're coming here. How do you manage that? How do you navigate? I mean, the that same draft conference? class competed to be the number one pick. I mean, you remember after Sam Darnold's pro day, we we thought we said it on the air, like that's a wrap. J- Jim, uh, uh, Jimmy yeah. Haslam's up in the stands. It's raining, and Sam had a great day. We're sitting there going, "Oh, that's a done deal. He's going to the Browns." Uh, yeah. So yeah, that'll but- be it'll be fun. I don't know how you look, DJ. I, I wonder from a front office standpoint, like it sounds great in theory to have this kind of competition play out. I do wonder from a coaching staff, like how do you manage and handle that to keep the chemistry and continuity of your team while trying to do this stuff? Man, it takes a lot of maturity in that quarterback room to make it where you're competing, but you're not tearing apart the, the fabric of the locker room. No. It'd be interesting. That's going to be interesting, to say the least. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back with some college uh, conversations here. One on a quarterback that will be an interesting name to follow as we head towards next year's draft. And then the, the big news, uh, a little shakeup there in the alignment of college football. We'll get to that right after this. Um, Bucky, real quick, uh, your, your audio is picking up from your headphones right now. Can you uh, check the audio settings again? Um, you just got your system preferences, I think, in the audio. Uh, okay yeah i think you're, you're good now cool okay all right three two all right buck uh let's let's jump into this quarterback conversation here I, it, it's just an early part of the process here i'm going to watch these top quarterbacks as we come into next year's uh college football season i like to watch those guys over the summer so i'm going to get to bryce young um, somebody you've seen for a long time, undersized quarterback, Alabama coming off a Heisman trophy. We've got CJ Stroud, another California mm-hmm. kid who's at Ohio state tearing it up. Those are kind of the two big names. Uh, but the name that I started with is one that I'd heard a lot about over uh, the last couple months of people that are getting ahead on the quarterback class. And they said, Oh, this is a guy that's pretty intriguing. This is the name you need to know. And so with that intrigue factor, I, I let off with Will Levis from Kentucky. Um, this is a transfer from Penn state, uh, played well for Kentucky last year. Uh, turnovers a little bit high. I think he had 13 picks, um, but somebody that's athletic can run around, can make plays. Really strong arm. Uh, there's a lot to work with with him. And when I I kind of looked at the comp, there's not a perfect comp for him, but I thought maybe younger Dak at Mississippi State. You know, you saw Dak mm-hmm. progress big time in his last year in college. I'm hoping that you see the same with Will Levis, but sturdy, strong uh, as a runner. He can he can ex- escape and extend plays. Um, there's a lot to like there on the negative side of things. Some, you know, he's just not a pure natural thrower. And I was trying to think of guys, maybe you could help me out. Like, who do you think it's, it's been really successful? I mean, Lamar doesn't have a natural motion. I mean, that would be yeah. one, obviously he brings a whole different skill set to the table, but he kind of guides the ball. He cuts himself off to the left. So in other words, he's closed off. He doesn't open up going to the left, like some just intrinsically, uh, natural things that you see with throwers. He's not a natural thrower. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny. I mean, it comes at a time when we're having conversations about Trey Lance maybe experiencing arm fatigue and Trey Lance being a tremendous athlete who offered the explosiveness in the run game, uh, was a developing passer. Uh, you, you do worry about that a little bit, but some of it you know, you can mask some of that stuff with your creativity, right? Mm-hmm. Depending on the way the offense is constructed. Uh, look at the Philadelphia Eagles and what they've been able to do with Jalen Hurts. And so you can do some of that stuff. But in the end, we're talking about a beauty pageant. And when we're grading these quarterbacks in terms of their franchise potential, you would like them to be able to be a, a, a pretty accomplished 
passer. And so as you're telling me, he's a work in progress. It's just something to keep an eye on and see what does he look like last year compared to how he performs at the end of this year. Do we see significant strides and growth in his game? And can we project that that growth will continue as we get into the other come the coming years? No, I mean, he's, and he's got a strong arm. You can see him drive the ball outside of the perimeter. Um, he's got plenty of, of RPMs. He can really do that. And, the, you know, look, competitiveness and toughness, I mean, those are those are key qualities that you want to have in a quarterback. You see it with him. He, you know, probably needs to dial it back a little bit in terms of lowering his shoulder on guys and being competitive as a runner. Uh, there's a game, uh, I, have my, I have my notes in front of me. I think it was Tennessee where he launches from the five-yard line, dives into the end zone. Like, there's a there's a kind of a toughness there that that's really admirable. Um, and then the ability to drive the football is there. Um, a lot of screen heavy stuff in some of the games, Georgia, they, they can't block them. No, nobody could block those guys. So you saw a lot of screens in, in that game, but some kind of open it up in, in some of the others that I watched. So an intriguing guy, um, you know, I thought, you know, I mentioned Dak, he kind of, you know, I think Blake Bortles was taller, but I think there was a little, I got a little bit of a, you know, a Blake Bortles thing there too, where Blake, mm. you kind of get excited about kind of the athlete and, um the toughness but Blake I don't think was a super or still playing I was isn't a supernatural gifted thrower you know yeah no I mean I think that's a good uh guy to bring up because he wasn't very natural and you know going all the way back to Blake Borders recruiting process some viewed him as a tight end not as a quarterback goes to UCF has a tremendous career goes into the league uh, and look it's a little rocky for him and he has some limitations as a thrower which ultimately hurt him with the Jaguars. Great comparison, though. Um, but, but, I mean, yeah, but a guy that's played, the guy that's won games, he's tough and mm-hmm. competitive. And, you know, I'm not saying that's – people think I'm zonking him. No, I think he's – this guy's got – he's got everything there. He's just got to put it all together. Um, but that was – you know, Dak was kind of what I was hoping for on the high end, maybe Blake, mm-hmm. uh, maybe on the low end, just to see where because he, Dak's in there. Yeah, because let's be honest about Dak Prescott at Mississippi State. Uh and I felt like I was high on Dak Prescott, but I had second round grades on him. And I thought he was more of a Steve McNair, rugged quarterback mm-hmm. type, physicality, toughness, some playmaking. Um, the intangibles maybe outweighed the, the, the talents and tools, um, but it was away from him. And so when we think about how Dak Prescott in the pros, to me, looks completely different than the guy that I saw at Mississippi State. He is mm-hmm. a a polished passer, a guy who I think is still a top 10 quarterback in the league based on how he performs, you know? And so look, it, a lot of it is the environment where he would go to who's whispering the sweet nothings in his ear when it comes to quarterback <laughs> play. Uh, yeah. So it, it's a compelling uh, evaluation because you're having to do a lot of different things to kind of figure it out. Yeah, and rugged is the word you use. That word rugged with Dak. That's the word. If I was gonna uh, kind of dr- take his entire report and narrow it down to one word, and I try to do that every now and then as a good exercise, I wrote rugged down is my word for him. So, I... all right, Buck. Uh, the other news I wanted to get to here before we run out of here: SC UCLA. They joined the Big Ten, which I know geographically I think confused some people, but when you think of monetarily, and to me, I would like to get your take on it just from a football standpoint. I love it from a football standpoint in terms of evaluators. It, it makes our job a little easier. Makes it a, a, a ton easier because now what I'm doing, DJ, <clears throat> my top two scouts are assigned to the SEC and the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's what we're doing now. That is coast to coast. Yeah. Uh, going back and forth in terms of the matchups, USC, UCLA, being able to play the heavy hitters. Yeah, I absolutely get a chance to see these guys against the, the players that I know are going to play on Sunday. For years, we've talked about it, SC and UCLA, the difficulty in attracting offensive linemen. Well, now you think about the offensive lines that play in the Big Ten and how they beat people up and how Iowa and Wisconsin have been able to year after year produce high end quality players. Um I think it'd be good. I think it'd be good for us to not only evaluate uh, those defenses against those Big Ten offenses, but I think the recruiting base, does that change? If you're SC, do you, are you able to get more into the Midwest to maybe get the linemen that you may need to play yeah. at a higher level? Uh, I, I think it's good. Uh, I'm looking for the next shoe to drop in terms of where does Notre Dame go and what are the playoffs going to look like? Yeah. That's the only thing I, I worry about. Is Notre I mean, Dame going to stay with the ACC or is the other shoe going to drop? 
you tell me, but if I'm, if I'm one of those teams in the, or if I'm those conferences, right, the, the Big Ten and the SEC, I'm sitting here going, we're good right now, what we got. Uh, that's just us. It's just us. You play your, you play your league, get yourself a conference championship game, league champion. We're going to play our league conference championship. And then we're going to have a final four or whatever. We'll take the top four teams or final mm-hmm. eight, whatever you want to do. There's enough, like they don't need the rest of college football. They they're good. They, they could, that's a champion right there. And maybe it's like a European soccer thing where it's, you kind of win your leagues and then you have champions league and you kind of play around some different things. But to me, there's going to be more meaning to being like, you know, an SEC champion or a Big Ten champion, the thing, it's like darn near you're a national champion. I mean, that's that's oh, that's yeah. the elite of the elite. Yeah, no, nah, the the only the only move that I could see that would give them a conversation, but it would be a lesser conversation, would be if Notre Dame went full time to the ACC. Yeah, there's no the way ACC they're doing Notre- that. There's no way Notre Dame does I that. I know they just have too much money in those sports. other two plays. If you're going to give up your independent status, you want to go where all the money is, and that's in those other two conferences. Yeah, the Big Ten uh, makes too much sense for Notre Dame geographically. They do, but the only it. thing is, all their sports right now play in the ACC, with the exception. Of I football. know, but they could bail, they could write the check and get out of that agreement. So you know what happens? I think if they get out of that, then I think the ACC falls apart because there's something where then their teams can go mm-hmm. and kind of figure out what the deals are. Or whatever. I don't know, man. Like I would say, if I'm the ACC and Pac-12, they blew it when they had an opportunity to expand the playoff and whatever. And by standing yeah. pat, like they they let themselves get uh, pilfered. And so I, man, I don't know. I I wonder about the future of college football. Those two conferences are good. I don't know what it means for everybody else. Does that mean that we now have a group of whatever 16 seed tournament? To have like there's a, still some there's still some, some some really good programs that are out there when you think about you know Oregon Washington you think about Clemson Florida State Miami um, those are those are still some big time chips that, that have to fall the question is I think I read an article somebody was saying you know you look at the shares you know with these TV deals and like okay you bring in the two LA schools man they're going to pay for themselves like that now even yeah. though you have to split the pie two more ways with the revenue they're going to bring in with the TV market. That means we all get more at some point in time. You're going to be a team. I mean, I don't know if that's Clemson or whatever, but they'd be like, okay, look, that's great. They have a good football program, but now we've got to give them a full share and they don't bring in enough money for us to make more money. You know, like, and I don't know if it's Clemson or whatever, yeah. you know, these schools are going to have to try and figure all that out. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Just the money, man. The money part of it is really interesting because you can't beat it. If you're talking about the big 10, uh, cutting checks a hundred million dollars per school it's harsh yeah it's i harsh. can't imagine the sec is going to be sec's are right there if, you know if not more that's so, it's hard, so it's hard, it's hard to, hard to get so here's my here's my scouting point that i that i like i mentioned i really like this well how many times have we said when we're when we're evaluating a pass rusher in the pac-12 or an offensive tackle in the pac-12 and we say you know like austin jackson usc he's athletic I think he's pretty good, but man, he only, I think the only good pass rusher he saw was against Epinesa in the bowl game yeah. or whatever, yeah, where he it. got that tore up. It. Remember? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but we're like, I, so the, I can't, it's hard to evaluate him. He doesn't play any, he hasn't seen any legit D lineman or O lineman. And it would be the same, you know, whatever offensive tackle you might have in another Pac 12 school pops up and he's a really good player. And you're like, yeah, but he doesn't see any good rushers. Like, we're going to know. And I think it's actually going to benefit these two LA schools because. It's it's just it is what it is, Buck. It doesn't matter if you're 10 years old or 22 years old. You play against better guys, you get better. Absolutely, you get better. And not only that, for us, I think it makes it a a, a cleaner evaluation. All when you have a chance to see good on good, makes it really really easy. When you have an opportunity to get guys um, playing against other guys that we know are going to play in the league, makes it an easier evaluation. Well, now USC, U, UCLA, they play against dudes that are going to play in the pros. Yeah. You know, um, and there's no knock to what has been going on in the Pac-12, but it's different in terms of the offensive of linemen that we would see in that conference versus some of the other ones. Mm-hmm. Now you get a chance to see these guys go against some fastballs and you'll be able to make determinations based on if they're fastball hitters or not. I, I like that part of it. 100 percent. And and same with the quarterbacks. You're going to see quarterbacks go up against better defense. So um, I guess we won't. I think that'll happen after Caleb Williams is is departed. So I guess it'll have to be for the next quarterback that comes in there. But it, it's going to make it 
again, just an easier evaluation. The more good on good we can get, the easier it is from evaluator standpoint. So all for that. Uh, anything else you want to hit on, Buck, before we run out of here? No, nah, that's it, man. I, I, uh, I'm just excited we got a chance to get back together and kind of do it all over again. Look forward to seeing if we can connect again later this week. Yeah, we're going to do it. I think we've got three. Uh, I think we got three pods this week. So uh, we're going to jump back into some of those divisions. Remember, we were doing that discussion on yeah. kind of the first and second year guys we were buying. Um, we have a couple more divisions to get through. So we'll knock that out in the next couple of podcasts. Anyways, appreciate you guys hanging with us. Leave us a rating and review. We appreciate those on Apple Podcasts. Drop any suggestions or questions you have in there. We'll take them. Uh, and we'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks. <laughs>